Green speaks tonight. Uh, he spoke to us, and I forget exactly what month, but it was a wonderful program on Sellers Park, and I know tonight's is going to be great too. Jim's the vice president of the Chisholm Trail Museum Board, and he volunteers along with his wife, Sunny, and they wear a lot of volunteer hats at the Chisholm Trail Museum. They do a lot of different things there to promote the museum and also to uh, clean and, and just do whatever's needed. And so, um, like I said, he shared a wonderful program with us earlier this year, and tonight's program sounds fascinating. So welcome, Jim, and thank you. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to the Sumner County Historical and Genealogical Society for having me back. I guess I didn't put anybody to sleep last year, so that's a good thing. Um, let me talk about the museum a little bit. Uh, we at the museum, uh, Gillian and Carrie are over there. Gillian's our president, and Carrie Cook's our uh, secretary, treasurer, right now. Um, We've been working pretty hard at the museum uh, on uh, trying to spru spruce up the building and some of the exhibits. Uh, Carrie's heading up the uh, team general store uh, group now and they're working to patch uh, the walls and do some painting and spiff up that exhibit. Um, there's a new uh, thing they're working on called Save the Fountain Project that Jamie Kuchar is uh, heading up where they got the fountain from the uh, Cook's Drug Store and she has it, uh, restoring it a little bit, at least cosmetically, and we plan on moving that into one of the rooms in the building, which will be quite an undertaking. We're trying to raise funds to pay for that, so uh, if you check out our website or Facebook page, which, uh, which is a Facebook page, that um, you can find out a little more information, and, and probably you'll see, hear some more about it. Um, I've been working down in the basement, trying to get the basement cleaned up, and prettied up so that people can use the ramp to access the building easier. Hopefully we'll get the, the elevator uh, safety checked and uh, then we can start using the elevator so these people that can have a tough time getting to third floor, they can get up there a lot easier. Um, but I'm here tonight to talk about the very first wheat festival. Um, so let's get started. Um, last year, a bill was passed uh, recognizing Wellington Wheat Festival as the official Kansas State Wheat Festival, which I think is quite an honor, and rightfully so. Sumner County has, for the most part of the last century, held a record for wheat production. Now, as I went looking up some information, I found several uh, towns and uh, counties had wheat festivals, but they've all pretty much fell by the wayside over the years. Now, I'm first going to uh, give a little uh, history and then I'll talk about the events and entertainment. Um, most of my information uh, comes from the uh, Sumner County Jubilee and Wheat Carnival Souvenir printed by the uh, Wellington Monitor Press, uh, printed before the festival. Uh, I have some pictures from the mu our museum archives and I did some research on certain circus acts and uh, other carnival acts to try to keep it interesting. So. Uh, Hopefully, I will. if I pull out some information from, I'll try to tell where I pulled that information so you'll know. Now, I really think a step back in time in a time machine, the very first wheat festival, would just be a blast. But um, I lost the keys to my time machine, so we'll just have to uh, listen to my presentation. I tried to put the presentation together so that it, it uh, is like you're walking down the streets of Wellington in the 1900 and uh, follow, I followed along with the fair program to kind of give you that feel. So Wellington has had a long history of fairs and, and festivals. Um, it was the county seat, so uh, Sumner County Fair was held here first. Uh, this is a poster I got from the uh, Kansas State Historical Society of the 1882 Sumner County uh, Fair. Uh, and if you look at it, you see they had uh, horse buggy races up there at the top. Uh, it says right there, finest half, half mile track in Kansas. I didn't know we had a horse race track here in, in Wellington, but evidently we did. Uh, half fair trains. Evidently they were trying to encourage people to come down from Wichita uh, each way, it says, during the fair. This is a poster from the 1884 Sumner County uh, Fair, and you can see the evolution there, it's a, quite a bit more colorful and more fun and uh, the picture in the center, you see the racetrack. Um, 
and the hot air balloon in the background. Uh, it says uh, half mile track again, good races every day, a good band. Uh, I found it interesting that it has the pictures of uh, fruit and uh, vegetables there at the bottom and not a picture of any wheat whatsoever. <laughs> now, in the late 1890s, uh, Wellington had a festival uh, called the Merchants Festival. And it was uh, mostly downtown merchants in the banks that put this on. Uh, this was a picture from the 1899 Merchant Festival Queen. And you'll notice her costume uh, won first prize. And it has uh, uh, banknotes stitched into the, the dress and uh, the coins in there. I like the little coin up on the top of her head. Uh, quite creative. Uh, this one was on the back of it, it said 1888. Uh, so, but it didn't have a name, so I don't know her name. This other one was, the, the first one, was Miss Edna Robbins. Uh, but again, banknotes sewn in. Uh, the crown on top of her head says first. You can't see it from that, that view. And uh, this one, uh, it was my favorite actually. It says uh, Frambers and Brumley Grocers. Um, and it looks to me like she could sell you groceries right off her, shirt, her, her uh, skirt there. Yeah, cigars. Yeah, cigars anyway. Maybe she made extra money that way. Yeah? No, I think those are cigars tied on. Um, the, the first Sumner County Jubilee and Wheat Carnival was held 112 years ago on September 18, 1900. It was held celebrating a record wheat crop of 7 million bushels and giving Sumner County the distinction of the wheat capital of the world. And yes, they even had a button. This is a, an actual button from the festival. Uh, we have it down at the museum. Uh, it's kind of a, a tough photograph because it's under glass. Uh, here's a blow up of it, uh, of it to the side of it. It shows, uh, says there, uh, raises more wheat than any county in the world. Seven million bushels and gives the date. It has a shock of wheat, of course, and that uh, bag of gold there for prize winnings uh, and a stock of corn. I don't have a clue what the rabbit means. There's a little rabbit over there. Looks like he's setting up, paying attention. I have no clue. I'd like to know what that meant. Probably a jackrabbit. Yeah, probably. I... So a committee was formed to organize the event. It was chaired by W.A. Wren, who was also a real estate agent here in town. Um, Greg has told me he doesn't know if he's related or not. He, he's never found that out, it'd be interesting. But he was a real estate agent, and it included the likes of uh, Mr. George H. Hunter, founder of the Hunter Milling Company. So it had, and there were some others, so it's high-powered people in the, in the community. Um, according to the uh, Sumner County Jubilee Souvenir, the committee and its officers, I, I wanna quote this because I love the way they wrote back then. It says, the committee and its officers have left nothing in their power undone that would conduce to the success, that would not conduce to the success of the carnival. Work has been well and faithfully performed, and the Jubilee of 1900 will mark an epoch in Wellington's history. I think they had it right there. Um, you know, what would they think if they knew it would be the Kansas State Wheat Festival now? Uh, the Jubilee was officially started at eight o'clock on Monday night, September 17th. Uh, with the crowning and inauguration of the Jubilee Queen. It was held in a large tent uh, seating 3,500 people. Professor Joseph Dunbar and his choir of 100 voices from St. Joe, Missouri provided entertainment. The Tyrolean singers performed during the cor coronation ceremonies. We'll talk about the Tyrolean singers a little later. Um, they, this Jubilee uh, souvenir quoted 3,500 people. I, I find that hard to believe, but they printed this thing up in advance, so they were probably shooting it. Um, some figures, maybe they were hoping. Pardon me? Uh, I do know the, the, that's the only one I know about, and we'll talk about her in a second. Um, now, I want you to imagine that this is a uh, just kind of close your eyes and imagine a little bit. The, the streets of Wellington are still dirt. Um, this, I believe this is a picture of uh, Lincoln and Washington. 
looking east, actually, and there's the big tent over the side, and I think that probably the inaugura inauguration was held in that tent. And this photograph is from the 1900 uh, festival. Uh, you know, just imagine 3,500 people, oh, I'm sorry, you know, dressed up in their best, uh, sitting on the bleachers, listening to that choir of hev heavenly voices, and watching this formal coronation proceedings, and, uh, you know, I just think of that and I imagine the smells, you know, uh, people smells, and horse smells, and dirt smells, and cigars, and canvas smells, you know, it just, uh, I'm sure they even had popcorn back then, so probably some popcorn smells. So, Miss Edna Sippy was crowned uh, Wheat Queen. Uh, she was the daughter of Dr. B. F. Sippy of Belle Plaine. Uh, she graduated from Belle Plaine High School at the age of 15. She received high honors while attending Southern Kansas College at Winfield. Uh, she was also a student of the Winfield Musical Conservatory. Uh, she was proficient in German language and the musical arts. And I'm quoting again, it said, Miss Sippy unites with a beautiful face all those qualities of heart and mind which go to make up the best type of young American womanhood. Yep. Sippy, S-I-P-P-Y. Uh, that she's got all her queen, queenly robes and attire. Um, take special note of the uh, crown up there. Um, in 1965, approximately four weeks after the Chisholm Trail Museum opened, a Mrs. H.M. Naylor of Tuscola, Illinois, visited the museum. And at that time, her mother, Mrs. Edna Sippy Brown, uh, the very first Wheat Festival Queen, was living in Tuscola, Illinois, but was, her health was too poor to make the trip, and she had her daughter donate to the museum the crown, the feather fan, and some of the decorations from the costumes she wore. Now this is a picture of the crown. We have it on display in the lobby in the museum. It, it's really not much. I mean, it's out of tin and, uh, and rhinestones, or, but you know, it's 112 years old and it's still kind of kind of pretty. Uh, actually, it's prettier on my computer screen than it is on the, the screen up there. But it's pretty amazing that we still have it. Um, okay. September 18th, Tuesday morning, started at 8.30 in the morning, 8.30 in the morning, with a band composed of 35 of the best musicians selected from leading bands in Kansas and Oklahoma. They started the day playing the Sumner County March and Carnival inaugural pieces on the corner of Washington and Harvey. Now this is the uh, Gaiman's military band, it was here in Wellington, and I think this photo was dated 1898. Um, more than likely they played uh, at the festival. Um, this is a picture of Hoos's band, Professor Hoos. Uh, I'm assuming that's him, and I think that's him in the center behind the drum. Anyway, they played, uh, this, this photo comes from 1904, but we have some dated uh, before 1900, so I'm sure he probably played at the festival also. Uh, we have one of the uniforms, I think, down at the museum on display, which it really needs some work. Okay, this all followed at 9 o'clock with the opening of the Great Wallace Glassblower Show and the Erie Ferris Wheel. Now, I found this poster uh, online somewhere, I can't remember which, where I got it, but it, um, this says the Sturk, the Sturk family greatest bicyclists. It's not the uh, glass blowers. Uh, I could, I did found one. I found one reference to the Wall, uh, Wallace glass blowers, and it said that they put on uh, besides blowing the glass, they would put on a Punch and Judy show uh, in between. Uh, but this one had these little glass things on the bottom, maybe trophies. I don't know. And I thought, well, I'll throw that in there. That ought to. But Mr. Benny Wallace, that's the person up in the top corner there. Uh, he was out of Peru, Indiana. He was a circus man and showman. He used several titles on his circuses over the year, including Cook and Whitby, Wallace and Anderson, The Great Wallace Shows, uh, and then he bought the Carl Hagenbach exhibition at the end of 1906, so he expanded. Oh, thought it died for a second. 
uh, and named it the Agamac Wallace Circus. And they toured for, uh, they were the, uh, the second largest touring circus show for 30 years, just uh, smaller than uh, Ringling Brothers. Now, the first Ferris wheel was introduced at the Chicago uh, uh, World's Fair in 1893 seven years prior to the wheat festival or the carnival um, and actually that uh, the 1893 world's fair kind of set the stage for most of the carnivals and um, festivals around after that the midways were set up very similar uh, or at least a similar could be to to the mock up there the very first ferris wheel was introduced uh, it was over 250 feet tall, had fully enclosed booths like little cabins. Each one of those little cabins held 60 feet, or 60 riders each, sorry. 60 riders in each one of those little cabins. So that was a lot of people. Wow. Now, what, they were, what they were trying to do was uh, top the Eiffel uh, Tower in Paris had been the World's Fair before that, so they were trying to top that as a uh, marvel, yeah. Which I think they probably did, except the Eiffel Tower is still standing. Um, yeah, and it was very well received. Um, of course, uh, the Erie Ferris wheel that we had here, I found a picture of one at the, in Grand Island, New York, and this was taken in 1900, so it probably looked exactly like this. And thinking about it, the Ferris wheel had to travel down here on uh, the railroad cars, and then they had to set it up and stuff, so I'm sure that it looked exactly like that. Probably carried two people. and. Uh, I think I figured it was about 40 feet tall. I was just guesstimating. At 10 o'clock on uh, that Tuesday morning, uh, Professor Bethel presented his trick bike bicycle riding performance. And my guess this was on some of those high wheeled bicycles. We have one down in the lobby of the museum. At 10.30, there was an ex exhibition of corn in wagons. Uh, that was held on Washington Avenue. Five premium awards were presented for the best 15 bushel of corn. Fifth place through first place. All wagons were decorated with bunting and national colors. At 11 o'clock, the parade of Colonel Garver's regiment of 500 men composed of farmers and regalia representing Knights of the Ear. Um, I, I don't have a clue what that was. I, I Googled it and uh, nothing. You know, everybody, a lot of these uh, people were obsessed with uh, these fraternal orders and uh, Masonic Temple and all the uh, pyramids and all that stuff at this time frame. So there were a lot of these orders and uh, fraternal societies, secret societies, if you will, out there. Uh, and um, I looked them up, and the, the order of the Knights of the Stoat and Ear was actually a knighthood order that was started in uh, 1448. But I really think these were just farmers having a big laugh, making a big joke. I'd like to have seen it. Uh, followed by General Dan Rice, Jr., who presented a free show of trained pigs. Uh, at 11.30, there was an exhibition of driving horses and draft horses, with three awards being presented to the best teams for style, action, and soundness and appearance. At 11.50, the Zaros, Aerolite and Trapeze Artists, Oh, I must have backed up one. There we go. Um, opened at 1 o'clock. And also at 1 o'clock, a show known as the Hindu Wonder or Living Burial was performed. Now, uh, I got this uh, picture of these uh, trapeze artists. I could not find a, a lot about the Zaros. I uh, did find a few references, but uh, no pictures, of course. The Hindu wonder or living burial, however, was a different story. This was a fairly routine carnival trick that was first documented in 1840s. Uh, it basically was an endurance test where this mystical Egyptian performer who claimed to use supernatural powers to remain in a sealed casket for an hour. Uh, he'd be buried underground for about an hour and then they'd dig him back up. Harry Houdini actually performed this trick himself a couple of times. Uh, but he bested it in August 5th of 1926. He remained in a seal casket submerged in a swimming pool of New York's Hotel Shelton for an hour and a half. Of course, he claimed he didn't use any trickery or supernatural powers, just controlled breathing. 
Um, there was also the performance of Professor Baby Bliss. Uh, I don't know what that was, couldn't find any reference to that, uh, but almost every traveling performer of the day, the, or snake bite peddler, they always use the name uh, Professor or Colonel. Um, so I, I can only guess that this was a musical performance or a salesman that sold a concoction of a liquid that made you feel youthful and blissful. Uh, two o'clock, there was a free show of Professor Meehan's famous 30 train dogs. Now, next, on Wednesday they had, uh, it was marked with parades and picnics provided by the Ancient Order of the Pyramids and the Anti-Horse Thief Association of Summer County. Now, these were non-Masonic organizations that were mutual benefit organizations, uh, these supposed secret societies. And I think in the like, turn of the century, 1900 uh, city directories, they're actually listed under secret societies. Um, they were uh, formed to help each other members succeed in life, and uh, they had rituals uh, and levels just like the Masons. Masons. The uh, ancient order of the pyramids also acted like an insurance company. I found a reference where uh, a court proceeding where they hadn't paid a, uh, a widower of one of their members, their, her uh, premium after her husband died. Um, the Ancient Order of United Workmen was also another mutual benefit organization, but it was more of a labor union, and it was founded in uh, Pennsylvania in six, 1868. Uh, it was, uh, like I said, a labor union aimed at adjusting all differences which may arise between employers and employees for the beneficial to both parties, based on the eternal truth that the interests of labor and capital are equal. Um, now this guy that formed it was a Freemason and he incorporated a lot of the various traditions of Freemasonry including the lodges or branches, uh, regalia and initiation ceremonies. Now the reason I report on this one with so much detail is because I found it interesting that this ancient order of United Workmen evolved into the Pioneer Mutual Life Insurance Company. Um, Thursday was the flower parade at 10.30 in the morning and it started with uh, horse carriages, floats, saddle horses and bicycles all decorated with flowers. What's the yeah. uh, You know, I, I think that's, uh, you know, I haven't studied that one. I'm going to guess that's the, one of the schools. Uh, that one. Yeah, I would probably say that's the courthouse. Yeah, I would say that was probably the courthouse. There's another picture where I think it's the courthouse. We'll look at the roof line. I'll have to get out some pictures of the courthouse and look at it. That's a good point. Um, I, I want to bring up a point. This, as you can see from this picture, that it's kind of faded. And pictures and documents, they all have a lifespan, just like we do. And uh, a lot of our old photographs are fading away. And, and we need to get them digitized so that we can capture at least what clarity we got left in them. Uh, and we're trying to do that. It's a slow process. Uh, we're trying to digitally get our uh, accessions uh, inventory down there also, which is a huge project. But we really do need to get this stuff digitized before it's all gone. Let's see. Cash prizes were given for several categories ranging from $1 to $20. Now this is a pretty striking photograph and uh, I want to read the caption that was on this picture. It says the Phaeton, I assume that's a Phaeton, P-H-A-E-T-O-N, uh, was type of wagon, uh, of Mrs. Jacob Engel and Miss Cora Newbold was in the shape of a great swan, the bird holding in its beak white satin reins over a snow white horse, harnessed in white and garlanded with flowers. Feathery white chrysanthemums imitated snowy plumage on the body of the vehicle. The hubs and spokes were covered with blossoms of a delicate pink. The ladies wore charming costumes of white. The street commissioner, Bowers, was at the horse's bit. I'd like to sing that one in color. And I believe the Mrs. Uh, Engel is, if anybody read my article uh, on the uh, Cir uh, Cary Circle ladies, I think she was one of the founding members of the Cary Circle also. 
Here's some more pictures of some of the floats, all decked up and ready to go. Uh, that would be the Security State Building uh, on the right over there, and of course the gold corner over here on the left. Uh, I thought this was interesting, four horses to pull two fake horses up on the, the float. Uh, now see, there's another building in the background, and I'm pretty sure that's the courthouse. It, it's harder to see in that on the screen. Um, Friday was the exhibits of wheat on Washington Avenue, with a review and parade of the decorated wagons. Prizes for the best wheat ranged from seventy-five dollars to two hundred dollars in gold. That's uh, a pretty good prize. Even today, I'd be pretty surprised. Now, this picture actually comes, I believe, from the 1904 Wheat uh, Jubilee, but um, I put it in there because uh, I wanted to show that they made that whole stage, presentation stage, with shocks of wheat. If you zoom in on that, those are shocks of wheat making that. And those pictures, I can barely see them on the screen there, but there's a picture of the two mills, uh, one of them being the Hunter Mill. Saturday was marked with the entire day given up for reviews of parades and carnival features. Uh, the night, there was a, that night on Saturday night, they had a fireworks display signaling the close of the Jubilee week. Now, if that wasn't entertainment enough for the week, make you tired, there was always that mystical place called the Midway, which opened every day at two o'clock. So let's take a little mental walk down the Midway and see what we got to see. Plenty of entertainment. The Midway started at the intersection of Washington and Lincoln, and then went westward on Lincoln, past where the Regent Theater is today. I brought this picture back up just to, because I believe this is facing east. If you were to do a 180, go the other direction towards the uh, Regent Theater, you'd be headed down the Midway. Uh, and here's a little map of it. And this map somebody made, and it was in our archives from the 1950s. And uh, if you'll see, it has the cat and lantern there on the corner. Of course, the Masonic Building, the Regent Theater, and the Playmore Bowling. I didn't realize the bowling alley was, was downtown. Uh, but anyway, you would start on that corner and work your way westward. Now, I don't know how they fit all that stuff in on that one block, but surely they went maybe two blocks or so. Okay, got ahead of myself. Walking westward, the first sight you might see would be the DeCraco Brothers, Streets of Cairo, and Oriental Theater. This show required 22 people, Two camels and two donkeys gave six performances per day in a large tent. The Streets of Cairo exhibit was based out of St. Louis, Missouri. It was run by four brothers, Andre, Gabriel, Jean, and George de Craco. They came to this country in 1884, and they exhibited at the uh, 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. And this is where this picture was taken. Uh, they were uh, one of the most popular shows at the uh, exhibit at the World's Fair, and they, there have been some claims that that show actually saved them financially because it, it did draw uh, uh, large crowds. But, you know, I look at those camels and donkeys and I don't think much about that, but the reason that they were so popular was because they had belly dancers. <laughs> and, of course, that really drew them in. I found a, a reference for, uh, in a, a book where a, a fellow, they had barkers that would sit outside these tents and call people in. And this guy was actually recalling his days as a barker and he worked for the DeCraco brothers for a while. And he was telling how he would uh, call the people in. He said the con was that you get them in the door, you call them in the door, and as soon as you got a crowd of people, then the show would go real fast. They'd, they'd go ahead and end it quickly so that they could move them out and get another group of people in. And, and they charged a dime for admission to see these shows. Now he actually had his sing song that he would uh, sing out while he was barking, and I want to read that to you, just because it, to give you a little flair. Uh, she's the best oriental dancer, brought to you direct from the midway of Chicago's World's Fair. She twists, turns, and vibrates in ways you never thought were possible. Let her show you. She can move every muscle, every bone, each and every part of her body. So come on and see the exotic dancer. I just thought it was funny. Different times. 
Next, as you walk down the midway, you might see uh, J.W. Tashidi's War on Canvas or Moving Picture Show. Now, they didn't have moving pictures in 1900, but it was in its infancy they were working on it. Everybody had their own little uh, take at it. And this, this program was actually called a Warograph. And I found several references, but nobody could tell me exactly how the thing worked. Uh, in fact, there's more on this Jubilee souvenir than there was in, in a lot of the references. Uh, I did find references that said it was developed by Thomas Edison, but I never found it in his list of patents. Uh, it was a precursor. It consisted of 36,000 feet foot canvas roll of painted depictions on the, of the Civil War, the Cuban War, the Philippine War, and the Boer War. It was all set to an electrical band of 20 pieces. Now the souvenir stated that it was painted on canvas, but most of the references I, let, I had listed showed them as photographs on canvas, and it would roll through and somehow it would have the illusion of a moving picture. Um, some of the references I found said it showed Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders right charging up San Juan Hill. But it also said that they thought that that part of it was filmed at Thomas Edison's studios. So uh, that, that, that made me believe that it probably was photographs instead of painted on. Now it said also that it was accompanied by a 20-piece electrical band, probably similar to these, uh, I don't say this right, orchest orchestrians which were you know, big player pianos that played lots of different instruments in one. The one on the right actually has violins in there. And it played the violin as well as played the piano. So you can imagine the sounds of the music that was coming out while you was watching this charging up San Juan Hill. The next sights you might see as you stroll west, I'll put this one back up, uh, is Bosco the Snake Eater. Uh, I, I think I would pass that one. I don't want to see the guy. But I, however, in this poster, I see a guy back there in a glass cage with a bunch of snakes. Uh, then you would see the Lunette Show. Now, the Lunette Show was also a very popular show at the time, and it was an illusion. Uh, it was a demonstration of overcoming the laws of gravitation by hypnotizing a woman and having her float around the tent under the control of the hypnotist. And this poster had a guy over here in the, above the white horse. It looked like he was kind of hypnotizing a lady. But what they said, this was a, an illusion and, and projection was in its infancy. So they would portray this guy hypnotizing this lady and then somehow they would use this projection to project an image that would float around the tent and make it look like she was uh, defying the laws of gravity. Next you would see the Australian bush girl or freak of humanity whose peculiarities excite the liveliest curiosity and wonder. I'm assuming that would be her in the cage there. Um, as you walk on down the midway, the next thing they had, or the next exhibit they had, was called Sappho, um, the living picture show in drapery. It was described by the New York papers as one of the finest art exhibit exhibitions ever presented in that city. I came across a few re references to this exhibit, but no descriptions of what it was. However, Sappho was a very popular Greek poet born on the isle of, of, island of Lesbos. She lived around 600 BC. She spent most of her adult life on Lesbos where she ran an academy for unmarried women. Uh, she, her school was devoted to the cult of Aphrodite and Eros. I'll let you take from that what it is. Uh, I can only speculate that there was probably some sort of allure similar to the belly dancers. But what I found incongruous is right next door, the next exhibit you would come to was the city of Jerusalem, which was a mechanical show, a miniature model of the city of Jerusalem, complete with Christ and the apostles represented by moving figures. And the last exhibit on the midway, which is also the most popular, uh, was the German village and the Tyrolean quartet or Alpine yodelers. Uh, this was a very popular act. Uh, they were all over. They even played with many orchestras. Um, and I found this handbill of theirs. Um, they, they performed for 40, 50 years. Uh, here's a picture of them playing their instruments. M my guess is it was supposedly a, a mock-up German village. And I imagine if you went in there, you probably drank a, a beer or two and watched the show.
Well, that concludes our little walk down the streets of Wellington at the first wheat festival. Um, I want to thank you for listening. Thanks again for the Sumner County Historical Society. And uh, I want to remind you uh, that we have uh, on display in the lobby of the museum the original Tierra Crown and some of the pictures of the floats. Um, also, for those of you who get our newsletter and read the uh, Cary Circle Club article, uh, we'll have some of the Cary Circle pictures and the scrapbooks, which are really neat. Uh, hopefully in the lobby in the next couple weeks. So if you have 15 minutes, please stop by and have a look. Um, we're also looking for volunteers to sit down at the desk at any time. Uh, it's always hard to fill that, that seat. Um, and anybody wants to be a member, I suppose we can sign you up for that too. Um, we're open just on the weekends. For now, we're opening start of June through daily, 1 to 5. Come down and visit us. Any questions? Did you have fun? Yes. Did you smell the popcorn? Yes. Okay. It was fascinating. Yes. Very good. Yes. I, I was just really kind of blown away by how much you guys have It was a pretty busy uh, week, yeah. Yeah, pretty busy week. Well, yeah, yeah I think they did. And this, uh, this Wallace, these circuses, I was amazed at how much information is out there. Almost too much. It's almost too hard to find these people because. Uh, these circus acts were, they'd travel from like, Peru, Indiana, clear to California and clear to New York, and they were all over the place. Uh, it seems like it's a lot harder now to get, what do you say, live acts? Well, you know, think of the times, too. There was no radio or television back then, so this was. But this was major entertainment. Major entertainment. And uh, now everybody's, you know, I'm surprised that you guys opted not to watch Dancing with the Stars to come listen to me, so. Dancing with the Stars. Well, you know, you made some comment about them starting at 8.30 in the morning. Well, these people got up with dawn. Yeah. The sun was up, they were up, so 8.30 went early for them. Oh, and listening to a big brass band blare out that kind of music at 8.30 in the morning, I, I would find, but I'm sure they enjoyed the heck out of it, so. Uh huh. Yeah, the flowers. Yeah, where'd they get all those flowers? Most of the greenery around behind them always looked kind of desolate. I thought, where'd they get all them flowers? Probably come in on a train. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure they have they have a tough time filling uh, floats in the par parades nowadays. So. Yeah, those orchestrions, piano things were probably uh, you know the MP3. Yeah, probably did. Probably did. Mm hmm. Well, I don't know about that. They, they, that's something they started later, probably. Yeah. I didn't find any references to that in this. But I noticed these were in September, too. Yeah, they were in September. And the merchants' uh, festivals were also in September. Uh, where the, was the racetrack? I don't know. I'd, I'd like to know that myself. I don't know where that was at. I'm sure it wasn't, it, I mean, by today's standards, like Sellers Park, when I did that piece, that was like the edge of town. Right. And that was uh, 1920s. So, you know, the baseball park, where the baseball park was, that was a hog lot. So, uh, I don't know, but I imagine it wasn't that far out of town. Well, probably not. It didn't be too far. But they had a picture as being pretty good size. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, stands and everything around it. Somebody had that frame somewhere. Poster of the Weed Festival? Oh, really? Hey, I. Sure. I grew up in South Dakota and been through here. My dad would tell about uh, the shock grain was put in stacks yeah. and then thrashed in the fall. Was that the shocks they shocked it here, too? And did they do the stack? Yes. 
Yes, I, I, somebody told me. Uh, uh, it was in the fall and not in the summer. Well, they, they actually, they, as I understand it, they cut it when it was a little bit green yet. Yes. And then they tied it and stacked it in small shocks, and then they tack all the small shocks into a big shock, and then let it set and cure. And then. Shocks were in my life. Is that right? Yes. Well, that's how I was told it was done, is that they did it when it was a little bit green and it had to cure a little bit. What's that? Wind froze. Wind but, but when I was growing up, they uh, thrashed in the summertime the, from the shocks in the field. They hauled them into the separator and, and did it right then? Thrashed. But my dad tells them when he was growing up, they did the stacking. When. Well, that's an, yeah, that's true too. And they had to wait for the threshing machine yeah. to come. Yeah, I had a, a fellow I talked to in down in Anthony, and uh, when he was a boy, his father was, I don't know if they had partners or what, but they would, uh, there were several of them that, that used, they, they'd take the thresher around every place, and they all shared the same thresher, and there must have been 30 some farmers. He, he was said, when he was a kid, he had to help them get across the creek because they didn't have roads to get it, and they'd have to take them two or three days to get that threshing machine across the creek. Oh yeah. But one of those steam tractors took seven guys to run it too. You had a driver and a tender and a water boy and it took a lot of people to run one tractor. Boy, I'm sure we want to get stuck in the dirt. <laughs> so either. World War I, so 1918 until 1938, huh? I was born in 18, but this was in 38 that I remember. Huh. Took a long time for that wheat to rot. Well, thanks again for having me. Thank you. Everybody drive careful and stay dry.